I'm really pleased to be joined today by Professor Ranabir Samadar to talk about his, well, I was going to say your latest book, but it is not really your latest book anymore, um, The Postcolonial Age of Migration. Before we get to the interview, I'll quickly um, uh, introduce my guest today. Uh, Professor Ranabir Samadar is the Distinguished Chair in Migration and Forced Migration Studies at the Calcutta Research Group in Calcutta, India. He is a prolific writer and has published widely and influentially on topics such as migration and forced migration, labor, political struggles, justice and rights, as well as the nation, nationalism and postcolonial statehood in South Asia. Among his influential works are The Marginal Nation, Transborder Migration from Bangladesh to West Bengal from 1999, and Karl Marx and the Postcolonial Age from 2018. Today, we'll be speaking about a more recent book um, titled The Postcolonial Age of Migration, which is published by Rutledge in 2020. The book offers a really fascinating and thought provoking set of arguments, I believe, and reflections and challenges, really on a broad range of migration related topics, ranging from refugee labor to citizenship and statelessness, ecological crisis, and Europe's so-called migration crisis. So this is a really fascinating book and there's a lot of arguments that we bring forward in the book. Um, we'll be speaking only about a small number of those arguments today. I think one of the real strengths of the book's, uh, book is, and, and it has many, but one of the real strengths is that you trace some of the precise kind of colonial and imperial genealogies that link today's discourses and practices to their kind of colonial histories and imperial histories. And I think what I also really like is that you conceptually differentiate between colonialism and imperialism or empire quite carefully. Um, and in the book, you argue that um, delinking the history of the nation in migration studies from that of the empire has cost us dearly, not only in terms of understanding why nations behave in a way they do, at least certain nations, but also in terms of understanding the critical role migration played in shaping modern social governance and population politics. So my question really is, if, if I could get you a little, to talk a little bit more about um, not only the importance of, of colonialism, but the importance, ongoing importance of empire and shaping the nation and migration and how that um, impacts, you know, the global age of migration today. This is a very significant question. Uh, let me briefly answer because of the paucity of time. One is how do you study migration um, uh, in a presentist mode, uh, but on a historical template. So this is a paradoxical task, yet, like all other things, this is contradictory, and yet we have to appreciate that this contradiction is, the, is at the heart of the whole question of the post-colonial age of migration. By this, I mean, very briefly, that on one hand, uh, the migration politics and the migration economy, uh, both are played out in society and in politics uh, along the lines of borders and boundaries. Uh, it is not only that migration uh, qualifies or migration uh, structure is determined uh, is shaped by the by the border and boundary making exercises and incidentally Stephen Castle never gave strategic importance to the whole question of boundary making exercises in uh, in uh, discussing migration on the other hand the very act of migrating is transcending boundaries is escaping crossing borders, yet it creates new borders. So how do you capture uh, this paradox? And I thought that instead of approaching it philosophically, which can be done, and I think it should be done, and I tried to suggest how it can be done, but again, my emphasis was not uh, discussing this in conceptual terms, but more in historical terms, that how this whole dialectic of migration and border making exercises, the play out 
or it plays out in contemporary history of capitalism and colonialism. So that's one reason why you find that those border making exercises of the colonial time, uh, I try to show how they are reproduced today, how the boundary making exercises of the colonial time by the, uh, by the uh, colonial powers, uh, that is reproduced not only by once again the metropolitan countries, but even within the uh, within the uh, uh, so-called countries of the South. So uh, that's one. The other thing is that I think one of the reasons why we thought that the present age of migration uh, may be conveniently termed as simply a present age and not qualify it as the post-colonial age is partly because we have not examined the study of the nation form well. And here I have two answers and pardon me for taking a minute more probably. One is that the, the reason why uh, nations think along imperial border making exercises along that logic is precisely because it is within the logic of the nation that you have also in a great many cases, I wouldn't say in all the cases, the imperial logic of extending borders, uh, uh, you know, and, and all other things that I have written in the book, even in labor market exercises. What is more significant is that in the labor market exercises, you find a combination of hard boundary keeping exercise, but on the other hand, flexibilizing, flexibilizing the same borders and boundaries so that labor can come in and can be utilized. And it is not necessarily always a territorial border. These are economic borders. Uh, these are borders of uh, borders that supply chain of uh, goods and services uh, cross. So this is, uh, this is how I tried to connect. Uh, I don't remember probably chapter three and four. One deals exclusively with history. The other deals exclusively with refugee economies and immigrant economies. And then the other, you know, where statelessness is being produced is discussed probably in a later chapter. So these are connected precisely because uh, I tried to suggest that the nation inheres uh, the, the some of the imperial uh, practices of uh, body making. That's one. The other is that, unfortunately, again, when we studied nationalism and think of all big thinkers of nationalism, very big thinkers, including post colonial thinkers, so from Gellner to Anderson to Hobsbawm to Tony Bhava, Partha Chatterjee, the entire range. They never placed migration at the heart of the nation making exercise and at the same time displacing that nation making exercise. So, the nation history of the nation form and the history of the evolving labor forms, they are intertwined. And this is what I wanted to argue that do not separate these two histories and how. The mobility of the 19th century or late 18th century to the history of the mobility of mid 50s, mid 60s, the, when the age of decolonization, let us say, comes to an end, and the age of nationalism, uh, they, are, they are linked. Unfortunately, historians and political theorists have uh, kept them separated. Uh, there were reasons, and we have learned much from their work, but I think that uh, our history of uh, our historical understanding of the nation form will be much more enriched when we uh, uh, place it on a platform of, uh, of uh, mobility. And to conclude my comment on that, uh, one of the reasons why our understanding of the nation remains incomplete, because precisely because the nation wants a certain kind of population, a certain kind of territory is perched on the fact that it will be able to expunge, to expel certain sections of population and entertain 
uh, another section of population as the core of the nation. So the people making exercise is actually dependent on what you referred just now to the whole politics of defining and making population. It is partly uh, built in the governmental techniques, but partly it is also uh, built in the national imagination itself. Wonderful, thank you. And thanks for bringing labor in because when I prepared the interview, I was actually preparing a question on, on your arguments about um, how the history of migration in many ways is the history of labor movements and the kind of technologies um, used by states, but also by intermediaries and employer to, to mobilize labor in particular ways. Um, but then I, I didn't bring that question in because of time reasons. I'm very happy you, you touched on it and brought it in. Something else I wanted you to speak on, and it directly links to, to the kind of practices of governance you've just brought up, is, is the idea of crisis. And today, crisis is a key word that many associate with migration. And in your book, you, you also speak about ecological crisis, and you, you kind of problematize the idea of the European migration crisis as of course many others have done. Um, could you give us a sort of post-colonial perspective or your perspective on the supposed crisis character of migration and also on the, on the political uses of um, the rhetoric of crisis in relation to migration? Uh, once again, you know, a significant uh, poser. Uh, I think you may have noticed that I do not devote a chapter specifically to crisis. I should have, I should have. And uh, as I hinted, I should have also, uh, you know, kept a chapter or probably in that chapter itself, what I call the crisis of life. So public health question uh, of refugees and migrants, which I, I mean, I mentioned camps and all that, but I haven't, you know, I haven't done justice. I think uh, I'm, deal with crisis in several of the chapters, but I think it deserved a much more focused attention. So therefore, this is one drawback of you know, that one of the book. But on the other hand, what I wrote and what I still mean, and uh, my understanding is enhanced uh, by my experiences of the last two, three years. Uh, you know, when the Greek crisis, the currency crisis or the Greek Eurozone crisis was taking place, and the European migration crisis. I wrote a book uh, that was published by Springer and uh, the Greek radical activists, they invited me to speak on my book, which is called uh, uh, A Post-Colonial Inquiry into Europe's Date and Migration Crisis. So in that book, uh, uh, I wanted to argue, it's a limited book, very focused on the Greek uh, uh, date crisis, and the European migration crisis. But I wanted to inquire historically, how does this feeling and how does this, uh, 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 this uh, experience of crisis uh, come? And Europe is in crisis is something that we had been hearing uh, uh, from the radical side uh, for the last 10, 15 years. I remember uh, I was invited to several meetings uh, uh, in 19, 2010, 2011, 2012, when radical activists were saying that, uh, let us rethink of Europe, uh, this Europe, uh, the EU is in crisis, the way the European community has been uh, uh, conceptualized and formed in crisis, which is true. But at the same time, when I uh, tried to uh, give it a kind of a material shape, to the indicators of the crisis, I saw that as far as migration was concerned, but I'm quite sure my insight or my argument would be extended to other things, that, uh, that some of the things had happened earlier. But as I say that like Algerians, after the Algerian end of the Algerian war, 700,000 Algerians migrated to France, but they did not call it a European migration. After the Balkan Wars, uh, 500,000 at a conservative estimate, uh, you know, uh, left uh, ex-Yugoslavia. It wasn't a migration crisis. But why is it that in 2015, uh, suddenly this idea of the crisis came? So at one level, uh, to uh, conclude my answer very briefly, there are material factors that 
lead to that critical point. Uh, it can be Europe's own idea and Europe's own policies of giving the continent a stable shape, giving the boundaries of uh, borders of Europe a stable shape. Uh, it can be related to European labor policy in terms of European economy. It, it has quite an amount of, and it is also, it has so much to do with the European currency crisis or Eurozone crisis. All these had to do with the way Europe looked at uh, the, 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 the whole question of, you might call the revenge of history, where the post-colonial region now presses back onto Europe that it's our time and we have come to claim what is ours or uh, why don't you allow us to enter Europe. So European internal crisis and European, you must say if it is an external crisis, a, a crisis that is uh, uh, set off by certain external events, whether it is the uh, war in, uh, in the Middle East, or, you know, unsettling events uh, on the uh, south of Europe, across the Mediterranean, uh, Africa, etc. It, 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 it's a combination of both that gives rise to the crisis. The second is also uh, important that, as you know, within each crisis or within what you call particularly the great crisis, you have a kind of a double movement of time. So on one hand, you have the secular time that is moving, whereas I say that certain factors, they're accelerating and they're bringing in the conflicts within that structure to a uh, uh, climactic point, to a climax. On the other hand, the actors in that situation whether they are parties, the societies, the states, they think that the crisis is coming and they have to do certain things and thereby they only accentuate the crisis and they expedite the crisis. In fact, they bring the crisis to a head-on situation. So it is, the, it is you might say, kind of a diachronic you know, uh, 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 movement where the internal actions actually then accelerate the speed. So that, that, that's basically the question of why Europe uh, in 2015 and others. But on the other hand, I think it is important to understand also that migration, uh, the, the, the idea that migration is something that is abnormal. And therefore, the whole question of the figure of the migrant as an abnormal figure and I invoke Foucault's very famous you know, lecture series, one of the lecture series, I think titled The Abnormal. So Foucault says that in 19th century, 18th century, the abnormal was found by the society, a three-headed child, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and now in the 21st century, the migrant has replaced those abnormal figures of Foucault as the abnormal of all time. So why did the migrant suddenly appear as an abnormal figure. And that is where <coughs> I think it would be important to investigate, and I tried to do it in my own insufficient uh, and inadequate way, that uh, precisely the way politics was uh, carried on, and precisely the way, as I told you, the economy was carried on, and our understanding, which always lagged behind uh, the real developments, we always thought that th this figure doesn't really suit well uh, with, the, with the time. And it actually accelerates migration. As I indicated, that the second movement actually accelerates the secular movement of time towards crisis. And therefore, uh, one of my anthropologist friends has coined the term, I think very well known, uh, very good, and but I had my qualifications of that. He, he said, shock migration. So migration is a product of crisis as well as migration jolts the society. It shocks the society. And I argued uh, in my conversation with Kim, if you're interested, I can send you the link, uh, where and his name is Biao Tiang, Chinese anthropologist, probably working in Max Planck and very generously invited me to two, three rounds of discussion and wonderful, you know, uh, 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 great insight. He wrote a fantastic book on migration in China. Uh, uh, and 
he he said that Ranabir, can you think of shock migration? Your book deals with it, particularly when you write a migration. But I say that look, one of the things is not only because the migration is produced out of a shock situation like the pandemic, uh, like great economic crisis, like wars, like massive labor shortage, like great technological overhaul. But at the same time, migration shocks society. And therefore, it basically exhorts the society to adopt certain things that if the society had not thought of in such, uh, you know, how do you put it in such schizophrenic terms, and if society had thought of it carefully, it could have dealt it with a, in a different way, it would have understood migration is endemic. There is nothing, you know, exceptional to the thing. The last point would be, what is the post, what the, is the post-colonial got to do? Precisely the fact that this understanding of shock, the understanding of crisis, they stem both material and conceptually from the fact that there is a region outside and the problems are coming from there. So it is out there, the post-colonial region. It is out there, the backward regions of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It is out there in those primitive worked on conflict ridden countries, completely ridden by public health inadequacies, etc., where life is always, you know, uh, uh, surviving from one risky point to another. It is from there that the danger to European stability or the stability of the United States comes. So crisis, the, our understanding of crisis has much to do with how do we understand what you may call the ground outside the reality outside. No, this was wonderful, fascinating. Thank you. And um, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, as you said, we are at the end of, of the time of the interview. But I just wanted to thank you again for, for coming to speak on your book, The Postcolonial Age of Migration, um, and just invite you to give any final words or any final thoughts that you want to share before, before I close the interview. Hopefully, hopefully, I, I have heard I have heard from Diego that Bristol has a very good collegium of researchers on on refugee migration studies. He was telling me. So hopefully, one day we can have you over to Calcutta, or when we occasionally go to Europe, uh, we can meet up and you know discuss our work, exchange yes. our. Yeah, that'd side. be wonderful. As as soon as we can, we shall hopefully meet in person in Bristol, Kolkata. I, I have in mind that probably I will go to Europe in March or April. Perfect. Europe. Perfect. I will stop the recording now, but thank you again so much for, for joining us. And um, yes, hopefully see you in person soon.